Hello and welcome to episode six of 21 for 21, our podcast about sport and media in the 21st century. My name is Jamie Coles and I'm a sport journalist and I'm joined as ever by sport marketer Stuart Levy. Stuart, how are we doing? Yeah, not too bad, Jamie. Uh, and yourself, how's, how's it going with you in the... Is it still the sun of Barcelona or no, not, not quite? It is. It's, it's not as hot as it was, but it's still sunny. So uh, yeah, I can't complain. That's, yeah, the, the, what's the, that's the old expression, the rain in Spain stays on the plane or, or, or something. It's the old traditional Brits abroad holiday holiday rhyme or, or something like that. So I guess, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll come to it in terms of your, in terms of what we're talking about today, um, what it is you're, you're specifically doing in Barcelona, but um, I'm sure it's, it's more than just just the weather, of course, that, that you're you're over there for. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, <laughs> no, no, life is good. How's everything uh, over there in Germany? Yeah, it's um, so up and down, up and down weather-wise. Um, but no, let's let's not not be classic Brits still talking too long too long about the weather. Um, let's uh, crack in and get go back to to Spain. Actually, um, you might remember, of course, in our in our first episode, we spoke about Ibayanos, the Twitch streamer, and how he's really making an impact on um, on the media landscape in Spain. We specifically focused on him streaming the Copper America on his channel and having the first exclusive interview with Lionel Messi. Uh, but also this week in Spain, he's made it even more into the mainstream media and he's on for the cover of Forbes magazine. Yeah, so he's made himself a well-known face now amongst Spanish speakers of all generations. My uh, my, my father-in-law, who's 60, was asking me about Ibai Llanos just yesterday. Uh, and it's yeah, he's, his face is on the front cover of Forbes España, which is the Spanish Forbes, uh, which is not just in Spain, is in Latin America as well, South America, Spanish-speaking world. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, he's been named as one of the top 100 influencers, and that's uh, influencers in, in the digital use of the word, um, for his, his work uh, as a Twitch streamer. And uh, yeah, he's been congratulated by none other than President wait, Pedro Sanchez, uh, the president of Spain for uh, his services to to streaming and broadcast yeah um so you, you said there's been in me based here, here in in germany there's it's not even made the news but there's been a he says that it was a, a volcano that he's sort of like the public face of the yeah. re- recovery effort or uh, yeah, so donating a lot of money or been a, he's been doing a lot on his twitch channel this past um couple of weeks to raise money for people affected by the volcano that's erupted on the canary islands and it's mm-hmm caused significant damage to La Palma. Okay. Um, which is one of the, the big kind of cities mm-hmm. in the Canaries. Uh, and it's where Pedro is from. I don't know if you follow Spanish football of and course, Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Pe- Pedro is from uh, La Palma. So he's also been involved in that. But but yeah, Ibai Llanos has been, uh, been doing a lot on his channel to kind of raise help and money and support for the people affected by the volcano as well. So it's it's good that, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's an influencer in this sense, in the in the Instagram Twitch sense but he's uh using that power to do some good in the world as well yeah and just as, as an, an aside i don't know if you saw him and pk have organized the uh the first ever world balloon keep you up championship no i mean that sounds um because <laughs> <clears throat> classic classic e-buy i guess it's the um pk involved that's that's one of the key e ingredients and something well there was a video yeah. went viral a few weeks ago mm-hmm. of um i think it was two guys and then two dogs as well like keeping the balloon up Oh yeah, and 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 from that video, they've kind of decided that it should be a a competitive sport. Oh, nice and, event, okay. And is now a, a global. They've launched a, a World Series. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I mean, so we say say World Series, but the the interesting thing about eBay is I've still, apart from the, the Rory Smith piece in the New York Times that we, we we've also highlighted. Have you seen much about him in the, in the English press? For me, it's still uh, on, on a Another podcast, the Spanish correspondent, Spanish football correspondent, did did did, did mention Ebay, but apart from that, um, yeah, it's still sure. He's, I mean, he's exploded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's exploded into the Spanish speaking world in in very yeah. much mm-hmm. a big way. Um, but always, you know, languages cause limitations within the rest yeah. of the world, and um, he he admits himself that he's not got a very good level of English. 
And uh, yeah, I think he'll be limited to to the audience that he, he's got. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean sorry necessarily that he'd suddenly get a, an English language audience, but the story it is impressive enough. It's not as if there's an Italian e-buy or a German e-buy or a French e-buy. It seems that he's still relatively relatively unique in the world. So just the headline story: Twitch streamer interviews Messi and broadcasts Copper America. That doesn't seem to have, to have crossed over as much as maybe we thought when when we when we started this podcast, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm I'm not deep deep into the Twitch world, um, mm-hmm. but we do have conversations about it. You know, I work in in broadcast media and and we mm-hmm. streaming and these these disruptive technologies that we have to take into account. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we do have these conversations. But as far as I'm aware, even the big American Twitch streamers or the big British Twitch streamers, no one's kind of doing these kind of collaborations with such big names and such mm-hmm. influential uh, players. Yeah, I guess it may be for for eBay. It's, it's a it's, it's a, a place in time. Maybe with any of new new media, there's a, just the conditions were right for him to to break break into break into the space. Yeah, um, and I think I mean I don't know what the Twitch sort of situation and the, and the the fandom is like in the UK. Certainly, my my British friends, none of them are big followers of any Twitch channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I follow um, Bill Al Zafar because I went to university with him. I don't know if you know okay. him. During the during the pandemic, he uh, he did like a it was like a show, like a, a weekly, twice weekly show okay. on Twitch, and he was playing Pro Evolution Soccer. I don't know some old PlayStation Two version, I think it okay. was. Mm-hmm. But he was doing the whole thing like he was the, like he'd put on a suit, like he was the manager, uh, okay, and he called, okay. like press conferences with the backgrounds and stuff. And it got more and more complex to the point where he was bringing in players, and you know it was like the computer. Oh, okay. Yeah. On from from Pro Evo and he was like photoshopping mm-hmm. background on them and he was having conversations with them and he was doing the both voices and and he got really elaborate and he he gained um maybe we'll try and get him on one day like yeah, who knows? Why not? You're, you're, you know you're really, yeah. <laughs> and um he, he's really interesting really funny i look him up on twitter um mm-hmm. i think his, his twitter handle used to be zafar cakes I, I think it still is um nice. we'll, we'll put it in the show notes why not yeah uh, but aside from him i've not really and that's, again, because I've got that personal connection yeah. with him, but I've not really heard of a big Twitch scene, if you like, and and this big Twitch following. But like I say, everyone here seems to be talking about Ibai Janos, mm-hmm. and and even people that aren't necessarily of the Twitch generation. Yeah, no, that is really, it is really interesting. Um, I mean, what we're we're gonna gonna come on to is where we have to think think the industry is going, and and. I don't, we don't want to get all deep into say why the, the Spanish were ready for a, a Twitch streamer, but maybe I don't know. The pandemic this, this, possibly had something to do with it, or maybe there was a a, a, a lack of um, I don't know, a lack of investment on in Spanish journalism schools or, or something specific that maybe there's, there's, caused there's, the there's gap research free to be done. I think, Stuart. Yeah, yeah, I think there's research to be done. Mm-hmm. Maybe we're the people to do it, <laughs> but I am worried that we might become a by Janos. Uh, fan podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, we've uh, talked about him on several episodes now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the advice from Rory Smith is anything to do with uh, anything to go by. If we get Ebay's attention, that can only be good news for us. But you're right; we don't need to we don't need to yet become 21 Ebay facts for 21 Ebay fans. We'll <laughs> we'll leave that for another time, and we'll talk about someone else working in the Spanish media industry. Yourself. So, um, yeah, the re- reason we're, we're we're doing this episode is. Um, for a number of factors, um, we just want to you guys who've been been listening to us so far get more of an understanding about why why it is that us who's bringing you bringing you these episodes, bringing you this content by by sharing our, our experiences and what what else we've been been up to. So, yeah, um, Jamie, how did you first of all? Do you want to? I think your current LinkedIn bio you call yourself a convergent content creator, I believe. Would you want yeah. to explain how you came to be a, or what, what even <laughs> is it, a convergent content creator? Yeah, okay. Um, so I kind of, people ask me like, oh, what, what do you do in your job? Or And, and there's no one thing. I do a whole bunch of things. I like I, I commentate matches. I, I um, record podcasts. I shoot TV shows. I go out and do like the bit of a reporter with the microphone. I do simultaneous translation. I record news bulletins. I put voiceovers on adverts like i do a whole bunch of stuff i write i write the titles for videos i sometimes do the website management i so i was kind of like looking for a you know a succinct title (laughs) yeah and and this kind of 
content creator kept popping up. And I thought, oh, you know what, maybe that does apply to me mm-hmm. because in any given week, I'm making a whole bunch of different content in different formats for different platforms. And that's where the convergent thing comes in because it's different content for different yeah. places and it, and it converges to tell the one story, whether it's about a, a FC Barcelona football match or about an element of sport media or or whatever it might be. So yeah, I, I sometimes it's just easier to tell people that I'm a journalist or a TV producer. Or, <laughs> yeah, but then you're right. Or, or, that um, it encompasses. It's not normal doing doing yourself ju- justice because yeah, a journalist you are. I think the journalist is in the basic description is telling stories, and that's that's what you do. But then TV producer we're speaking now this isn't tv production but it's content creation so yeah i guess a content creator is a, a fair fair enough as close to a catch-all status as possible i suppose yeah but that being said i think a lot of journalists now could probably class themselves as content creators as well i think mm-hmm. uh, most journalists these days no longer just write columns or just run a radio show or just have a podcast or they do all of those things yeah and um and i think that's the the kind of the landscape we're in now in this in this world and it's not necessarily a sport as well i think uh outside of sport whether it's politics or I don't know, music or culture or or whatever i think a lot of people now are no longer situated only on one platform yeah no i think it's it's, it's true um certainly for what i'm i i consume as a as a consumer for, for want of a better word it's it's because sometimes the same people you might see on tv listen to in a podcast and read read, read about on, online so um, they certainly got to have the different knowledge or the different the awareness that you've got to be be active in lots of platforms. But what um, specific n- knowledge to do all those sorts of things? Like, did you again because the industry changes so fast? I think you you studied media, am I right? But what did you actually study, and how much of that is already out of date in the ten or so <laughs> years since you were at uni? Yeah, I was actually yeah reflecting on this the other day. I studied a course called Media Writing and Production, which was mm-hmm. more about TV and films sort of long form media, mm-hmm. um, scripting and producing documentaries or TV series, dramas or films. Um, mm-hmm. And at that point, I mean, we're talking two thousand and eight, so mm-hmm. like YouTube was was very young. It, you know, it wasn't very well known at all. And and I remember sort of when we got making films, short films, mm-hmm. um, which was mostly what what the kind of course was geared around was, was yeah. either scripting long form or, or creating short films, three to five minute films. Mm-hmm. Um, and they kind of said to us, don't put them on YouTube, because if you put them on YouTube, you won't be able to take them to festivals. You won't be able to sell them. Oh, OK, OK. And whereas now, like, it's almost like difficult to believe that you can make something and not put it on YouTube <laughs> because you yeah, want I mean, the world that's... to see it. And yeah. so many people have come from a platform like youtube or twitch or uh, even instagram mm-hmm. and and have gone on to do i don't know direct huge adverts or even even feature length films or or whatever so yeah it's changed massively since i i first started studying it um facebook was very new for example you know we mm-hmm. just I, I think 2008 was just that moment where myspace had kind of died a death yeah and facebook then... had, had had sort of had, had come along and, and replaced it if you like i don't fully agree with the idea that facebook replaced myspace there are a lot of features that myspace had that facebook didn't but anyway that's a, a different <laughs> issue i think um but, but that was kind of the world you know was mm-hmm. facebook was very new uh youtube was very new we were filming on digital tapes we okay. could yet mm-hmm. to move on to uh flashcards mm-hmm. um and, and as a result, the process was much longer. You know, getting a digital tape onto a editing software, you, you almost had to sit and watch it in real time. So if you had 30 minutes of footage, you'd put the tape into the, the recorder that was plugged into the computer and you sit and watch 30 minutes of footage before you could start editing it. Whereas oh, now right. it's literally a case of copying and pasting it from the, the SD card onto your your hard drive. Yeah, I mean, I, that's something I... Yeah, I mean, my... my dad had a video recorder when we were kids just to film film family stuff but i just hadn't appreciated it from the yeah production point of view what actually happened i mean he obviously didn't edit them he just put them on a vhs tape but it's certainly um yeah pretty interesting that in the literal physical part of the job um i guess cameras are all a lot significantly smaller if it's just the sd card now and not not full yeah. of physical tapes and yeah and they've got yeah. you know 
or all they're a similar size, but they've got extra things like stabilization yeah. or you know, by then, you, if you wanted to kind of hold the camera and like keep it steady, you had to keep two hands on it. Whereas now, mm-hmm. a lot of them have got built-in stabilization, and obviously, you don't want to be moving it around too much. Well, iPhones now have pretty course, decent yeah. stabilization, mm-hmm. or, or GoPros, which are tiny, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's the kind of the landscape has changed drastically, <laughs> yeah. um, and then you know your distribution options were limited. Mm-hmm. You if you if you created a a series. You, you know it'd have to be 21 minutes so that you could sell it to tv of course or to be to be kind of a half hour series mm-hmm. or or 48 minutes um if it was going to be like an hour episode with adverts mm-hmm. um whereas now you know people are filming six minute documentary episodes and uploading them to youtube and they've got themselves a, a youtube series and they're getting hundreds of thousands if not millions of hits yeah um, um so that 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 rule thing about don't put on on youtube what your teachers were saying that's that's gone or it it doesn't really matter if you can't enter festivals because the distribution is is all on on youtube like you want the visibility rather than the the festival yeah i mean i guess there's there's probably still an element of prestige with like film festivals Mm -hmm. um and a lot of film festivals want some kind of exclusivity yeah um but then i guess you have to weigh that up against the, the potential visibility that you could get with uh with putting it on youtube Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and where that could lead yeah so what, what was the, the first video you you put on on youtube was it a, a university project or is it since you've been doing it professionally or what what's your uh what was your good first question <laughs> I, th- I think it was probably a university video i mean i've been making videos now so i'm, I'm 32 now i've probably been making videos since i was 15 or 16 okay um in a, in a kind of in, a, in a, an actual making a full video i think we probably filmed yeah. skateboard videos on an old vhs camcorder when i was yeah mm-hmm. 12 13 but uh one of the first things i can remember like actually recording was a, a concert at school okay when i was in high school and mm-hmm. and we set up i think we had three cameras we, we and they were like little handy cams yeah. with digital mm-hmm. tapes and uh and we edited it and we had like we had like what we considered pretty pretty finished good, good footage yeah um you know three different angles of the stage yeah. and the person mm-hmm. playing the guitar or whatever and so I, I probably they probably ended up on youtube but like a few years later um because that was pre-youtube yeah so there's a they went in the in the archive they were filmed for the sake of being filmed and then because there was nowhere to even put, put yeah those, and we all, uh, you know mm-hmm. it, it was a high school thing so we all went off to university and, mm-hmm. and i on my hard drive i had this i don't know however many minutes yeah. of, mm-hmm. of of a concert that we did and so i put it on yeah. youtube so we could all enjoy it and that was kind of the Mm-hmm. you know and for me that was a, a dawning moment as well of like ah oh, youtube is, is this way of sharing video that's cool you know yeah so, mm-hmm. it's a different thing yeah. and then yeah once i once i graduated and we realized that we weren't going to do film festivals really and we just wanted to share what we've done yeah uh we ended up putting probably most of the stuff we made during university on there and and nice. then and, and beyond so, mm-hmm. so yeah Good. and then now now we make stuff FC Barcelona's YouTube channel. I think we've got at least one video up there daily. Yeah, for me. Uh, MotoGP. When I was there, I think it was a similar deal. So, and if it's not on the YouTube channel, it's on our on-demand video platform or, or whatever. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, a, another videos. thing that even YouTube is declining in. I don't know, maybe declining popularity is is the the wrong phrase, but you're right. There's so many alternatives now we, we've we mentioned twitch earlier there's the um rights holder specific video on, on demand platform so it's there's no longer i mean for, for me i, yeah, I would rights, rights holders yeah. and broadcasters you know mm-hmm. bt sport have their platform uh, bbc have their platform mm-hmm. the zone have their platform and they're not they're not necessarily right holders they, yeah. they've got the rights to broadcast and and but then rights holders also have their platform yeah you know right this is so many um so many different places where you can watch and, and, and stream and um yeah so youtube it's just it's still still dominant it's still the first thing you, you maybe think of when thinking of, of videos but they're still you can find find them find them pretty much anywhere is it tiktok last month surpassed youtube viewing figures in in england and america yeah i mean again the even since we spoke about tiktok on on, on less than two i'm sure the, the figures have just risen and risen and risen for for tiktok so i think that's yeah. of course a different type of content a different type of video I- I- entirely so yeah so certainly since i i see even when i graduated you know, i graduated in 2011 mm-hmm. since i graduated university i think the demand on our attention 
has increased drastically. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a big, a big difference, and it's something we've had to react to as a as an mm-hmm. industry and as yeah. individuals as well. It's mm-hmm. you know both as as creators and consumers, in fact. Uh, and and you do you do feel saturated some days. You know, I, I could spend all day here looking through footage to make some video or another, mm-hmm. and and I looked through I don't know the entire season of uh, Barcelona in two thousand one two thousand two season, for example. Yeah, of course. and then I get and then I get home and and mm-hmm. like I unlock my phone and I've got Twitter or I've got Facebook mm-hmm. or Instagram or I've got whatever. Yeah, and all of those are trying to funnel content to me as well. And sometimes, like some days, I just feel absolutely exhausted of watching yeah. content. It's like I need to get rid of my phone, but at the same mm-hmm. time, I have that that fear of missing out, the FOMO, and yeah, and and you know, it's it's certainly the demand on your attention is 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 far greater uh, mm-hmm. now than it was. Um, yeah 10 11 years ago when i graduated Definitely. so from 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 graduating um graduating to spain we were working in in video production in the uk yeah, in that so, time in between or yeah so i i had a bit of a an unusual path i i, mm-hmm. I went to academia from from graduating okay and, and i was looking at how stories could be told within education mm-hmm. so we were looking at like we had this kind of idea. Uh, there was a professor of, of education technologies at, at the yep. university I went to who had this idea that like going to university was like a three part story. You know, you had year mm-hmm. one where you knew nothing. And then as you learned and you became like an expert, yeah. you know, by the time you graduated in your third year, you got this like story arc and you know, you have personal, emotional challenges, you have like, academic challenges and it, it makes a great mm-hmm. story. Yeah. Uh, so we had this idea that students could make content okay. of, of their the university period some of that content maybe they could be assessed on it instead of writing mm-hmm. an essay okay and then they could present that to employers and be like hey look at what i did at university and rather than yep. just showing a, a cv they've got this kind of cool video of, mm-hmm. of everything they did so we tried that and uh i published a few papers on that and i came mm-hmm. away with uh what is essentially um, a master's of philosophy but okay there was nothing ph- philosophical about it really <laughs> it's what you call you know a phd is a, a yeah. philosophy doctorate Mm-hmm. Um, so I came away with like essentially the master's equivalent of a, of a PhD, oh, well, okay. I, I complete to a PhD, mm-hmm. um, and that was essentially in storytelling for for education. Okay, okay. So, and at the same time, yeah. I was also working as a freelance video producer. Okay, so you were YouTube. getting a I bit was still adverts and mm-hmm. you know sort of corporate videos for for YouTube. It's pretty. You um, you were a teacher and a student. Would you say at the, at the same time? Uh, you were still learning, using that as, as a learning curve for um, for yeah for what you've went on to do. And yeah, I think we've spoken spoken personally. So your first switch abroad, it was for English teaching. So that was yeah. So so moving with... to Spain, like I decided I wanted to come to Barcelona, um, mm-hmm. and, and the, the easiest way for a Brit to get to Barcelona is to teach English. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I didn't leave the storytelling. I didn't leave the video side of things. Uh, I mm-hmm. used videos and films and TV episodes to teach English. Yep. I got students filming little dramas. We did some green screen stuff. Mm-hmm. So all, all that time, I was still putting these kind of video production skills to use. Yeah. And then from there, I found a job with MotoGP. And that's how I took the step into sport. So I think in this this world of sport media, and we'll get mm-hmm. more into it down the line in sort of um, specific skills but I think there's there's two ways in I think you mm-hmm. either be passionate about the sport or a sport yep. and you learn the media side of it or you become passionate about the media storytelling side of it yep. and then you you go into the sport you know, okay. you yeah. sport. Mm-hmm. so would you say that's, that's what I did. Yeah. so would that be accurate for your, your colleagues then would you say your colleagues are split down the middle between the media background and the sports background people was that, was that yeah. a fair enough representation of your yeah, yeah, yeah. way so you work now that's... That they are huge mm-hmm. football fans and they yep. went to work in, in football media so they learned the media side of it mm-hmm. and then there were the people that were just interested maybe in sport media in general and they specialized into football or they specialized into the motorsport or whatever yeah and then people like myself who sport was never the big priority my, my big passion has always been storytelling mm-hmm. making videos and uh, and sport was just a, a way to do that and i got this opportunity in motor gp mm-hmm. i was there for a few seasons making mostly running the kind of the video side of their website motogp.com yep mm-hmm. um so involved making videos writing the titles for those videos mm-hmm. uploading them to the website publishing them 
Um, and then from there, I made the step to to FC Barcelona, where I am now, uh, in mm. their new OTT online on demand TV platform and uh, Barca TV Plus. And mm-hmm. with that step, I also stepped kind of the other side of the camera. What I was doing in, in MotoGP was very much the production and editing side of it. Okay, okay. So you weren't on screen then. At... I did some voiceover, but I didn't do anything mm-hmm. on screen or, or any kind of like live stuff there. Yeah. And then when I came here, they were like, "Hey, we need someone to do." to do live, you know, commentary, live matches, yeah. uh, and, and you're going to have to do it if you want to be, <laughs> then like, oh, you know, why not? We'll give it a go. So uh, it's not like the, sorry, the, 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 the cliche, I don't know where you might see someone behind the camera is desperate to step in front of the camera. So they do all the odd jobs behind the camera to get seen on camera. You weren't like that. You were, you would have been happy to remain behind the camera. Um, I've not really, never really uh, <laughs> reflect on that. It all just kind of happened, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I guess so. Yeah, I was. I, I enjoyed the job that I was doing, and and coming to Barca kind of led me on a different, mm-hmm. a different walk in the road, if you like, on a different path. Yeah. Um. And and I, now I very much enjoy the live in front of camera stuff as well. Um. Yeah. But, yeah, but at the same time, I think there are a lot of people that that, that they know very well that doing that stuff isn't for them. Mm-hmm. And and they they're happy telling stories off camera or or on the opposite people that don't want to do anything off camera and they yeah they want to star mm-hmm. uh, so yeah so that that's that's been quite interesting yeah so what would be your best best worst experience really for that you, that that you can share with us either from specifically about your time in Barcelona or, or your time creating video back back in the UK sure uh, best experience that's a difficult one um i had a pretty crazy day over the summer when uh when messi left barca mm-hmm. and and i did the simultaneous translation for his press conference and that was viewed by millions of people live uh and then that same day we had mm-hmm. the the gamba trophy which is the the barca trophy that sort of yep. kicks off their season every year mm-hmm. and i then presented and commentated the women first ever women's gamba trophy match which was against juventus so, uh, so that, that was a pretty mm-hmm. Uh, adrenaline filled day from, from start to finish. You know, the Messi Prof's conference was pretty early in the morning. Oh, okay, that's uh, like a good question about timing. Yeah. Of, the match was then kind of like prime time, like I think 6 p.m. or something. Um, yes, yeah, so again, they're and, almost uh, com- completely different things. So, from translating a press conference that's, that relied on your language skills, then suddenly to switch off from that at a big, huge day in Barcelona's history to be in ent- entertainment mode or in- into yeah, commentate and, and, and present on a game. Mm-hmm. And very different situations as well. You know, you're in a, mm-hmm. to do the, the translation, you're in this little room that's, okay. you know, you can't see anything. It's like soundproof. You've just got a little screen yeah. and you get given the audio and, mm-hmm. and you, you know, you got to, to focus on what they're saying and, yeah. and repeat it in English. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's something I've still kind of process mentally yeah it's it's a weird feeling like mentally mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to explain it but yeah. to, to listen to someone talk one language and then speak the other language is uh it's, it's a weird thing and then yeah and then we were in the stadium for the mm-hmm. for the gamba trophy with fans and with you know the whole ambience of a of a match and uh so yeah it was it was a thrilling day it was a very exciting day yeah that's definitely a standout as a, as a positive experience as a negative experience i don't know <laughs> i've had plenty of days that just get really really long mm-hmm. and you know, you get to work at nine in the morning, whether it's on set or it's in an office or it's uh, yeah. out on location. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, the day drags on and then there's other events that need covering and things happen and it just goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. And uh, the, the hours can quickly add up to, to 11, 12, 14, 16 hour days. Yeah. And sometimes you're not necessarily doing anything all that time. You're waiting mm-hmm. for something to happen. Yeah. Uh, which can also, it, it's also quite common in this, this mm-hmm. world. Um, you're kind of waiting for you know you know news is going to break but you need to wait for it to mm-hmm. break or you know somebody's going to come and say something or can come and do something you need to wait for them to do it or um so there's a, the, yeah i've had a lot of days like that a lot of days mm-hmm. like that and that's that's certainly one of the downsides uh, I, I remember the the british grand prix mm-hmm. 2018 at silverstone i wasn't in silverstone i was in the office in barcelona okay mm-hmm. but the day before they cut the day short because of rain and there's a load of crashes and then basically they were waiting for the rain to finish. And we mm-hmm. spent, I don't know, hours in the office just watching the, you know, the rain maps, like the weather maps yep. mm-hmm. to try and see when there'd be a gap and that. And then in the end, they canceled it. And it was like one of those, 
heartbreaking days where you're waiting around for nothing to happen Mm -hmm. but then we couldn't go home because we had to do all like the kind of press reactions and and put out put out like formal communication you know uh, press releases about what had happened and why Mm -hmm. and interview the the riders uh, about the situation so it was like it was one of those days that that is exciting as journalistically Mm because you're kind of waiting for something to happen you try and find out as much information as you can you know, we were trolling Twitter for people that were actually there. We had people yep. on the phone that were actually there. Um, but at the same time, it's it was, it was a damp squib in, in a very little yeah, yeah. sense. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So there's, there's, you know, very the highs and lows in, mm-hmm. in, in sport TV are very big, very drastic. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of um, sport TV, would you say there's, there's too much of it? Or is it is it... A very good thing that, that the fans can see pretty much any any event live if they have the subscription or they if, if they have the access to the streamer uh or do you think there should be some sort of cut back to make live sport a a big thing again like something i think i think the move away from linear tv mm-hmm. and i still think a lot of people watch sport on sport broadcast live on on regular tv i think it's, yeah. it's still a big part of it but I think the move away from that mm-hmm. has allowed more people to watch their sport or their team that they love, which isn't necessarily the team where they live or, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's global now, very mm-hmm. much so. And you can go anywhere in the world and watch a La Liga match or a Premier League match or a yeah. Formula One race. Or, and, and I think that is, is very important. Mm-hmm. And I think more sports kind of going digital and going global in that sense can only be a positive thing for those sports and be a positive thing for the fans. Yeah. However, I think there's a lot of demand on our attention mm-hmm. and there's a lot of, of like fracturing of sport and sport yeah. content. And as a result, maybe you end up paying a lot more money for something that before you could watch for the cost of whatever your TV license was per yeah. year or, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're a football fan and you want to watch, I don't know, uh, League, League One from France yeah. or La Liga mm-hmm. or Bundesliga and the Premier League, you know, you probably end up paying like five different packages yeah. to be able to mm-hmm. watch every match of the season. Yeah. But then again, yeah, you're um, right. Or even just the Premier yeah. League. If you're in the UK mm-hmm. and you want to watch the Premier League, you know, you probably need Sky Sport, BT Sport, and maybe Amazon even Prime. Amazon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to mm-hmm. be able to watch all the matches. Yeah. And I think I think that's a shame. I think that's mm-hmm. a, a a negative thing. I think mm-hmm. kind of fracturing of sport and sport content is a it's something that that's detrimental yeah. to the sport in terms of the fans being able to view it and, mm. and love it. And I think, I think we need to, as an industry, I'm going to say mm-hmm. we, um, you know, there's very, very You're little influence yeah. someone like me can have, mm-hmm. but I think as an industry, there needs to be work done to remove some of the barriers that have been put up. So I think that there's, there's those two sides, you know, now it's mm-hmm. global. Anyone anywhere in the world can watch it but yeah. at the same time. It could be more expensive or more difficult uh, depending on where you yeah. are. And what uh, about, Sorry, yeah, the the types of content like the clips around the the either the banter accounts or the um, the interviews or the is is that just great creativity or or is there like uh, in is this not time for me as a as a big a big sports fan to watch to watch and listen to absolutely every everything there is is there too much in terms of Twitter clips or, or random YouTube reels from I, I I I like these fan accounts and these fan accounts mm-hmm. do really well on YouTube, mm-hmm. like really really well. I mean the ones that do well, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> probably every I don't know three hundred fan accounts on, yeah. on YouTube that are making weekly episodes about their team mm-hmm. or their sport. There are probably I don't know a dozen that are getting most yeah. of the views, mm-hmm. um, maybe even less than that. But I think that's a really cool thing. I think it's great mm-hmm. that fans can participate now in that way. Yeah. And I think for me that's. That's exciting that, you know, I've been able to make this cool, cool content. I am able to make content because I work for, I've worked yeah. with Adorno Sports, the right holders of MoGP. I work for mm-hmm. FC Barcelona, who, okay, we've not got the rights for La Liga, but we've got the rights for all our content and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but for a Barca fan to be able to make their own content about FC Barcelona or a MotoGP yeah. fan to make their own content about MotoGP or a Nottingham Forest fan to be able to make a weekly podcast about Nottingham Forest. Mm-hmm. I think that's really cool. I think that's really exciting. Um, but there is a saturation. And I think mm-hmm. as consumers, we maybe need to learn to prioritize where we get our, 
uh, yeah. content from and uh but there is there is a lot of sport content out there that's for sure yeah definitely um so in are we are we at the peak point yet or is there still more 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 to come <laughs> who knows as more platforms appear and grow and and more ways of getting content out there you know we talked an episode two about TikTok. We've done an episode one about Twitch. Um, I've been. I was reading just yesterday about Snapchat being a huge place for for sport content. I was completely unaware of. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've not I heard think, Snapchat in, in a while. No, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems to be having a, a bit of a renaissance. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, I think maybe it's just it mm -hmm. depends on what happens with these platforms and and where fans are going. Yeah. At the end of the day. You know, as content producer, we need to follow the fans. And if our fans mm -hmm. are on TikTok, we need to produce content for TikTok. Yeah. Um, what I do think we'll see, and what well, what I really hope we'll see, is a kind mm -hmm. of bundling of on-demand video. Yeah. So maybe if you buy uh, the Premier League mm -hmm. packages from the I don't know, the Premier League rights holds, whatever, maybe you also get access to Man United TV or Liverpool TV or yeah. mm -hmm. some kind of, of deal that I think we'll see with the likes of... Um, I think it's at Disney and Warner or HBO and Warner that are talking about putting a, an entertainment package out together or they have done in the States maybe. Okay, okay. Um, I, I think we really need to see kind of collaborations between the different yeah. on-demand um, sort of distributors because, mm -hmm. as I said before, having to pay for Netflix and Amazon Prime and DAZN and yeah. HBO, like... It, it, it's just too much the cool, so the be... cool thing mm -hmm. the cool thing 10 years ago about netflix was that everything was there yeah it was the they had the marketplace for themselves though certainly that they had the first mover advantage in in, in ott yeah. and, and streamers and, and, definitely I, and you know i don't want i don't want monopolies mm -hmm. either yeah um but i do think that there needs to be some kind of bundling and that that clubs like fc barcelona like real madrid mm -hmm. uh like manchester city like liverpool like manchester united uh, like Milan, like yeah. Bayern Munich, like PSG, that have got their own, mm -hmm. you know, TV channels or their own, yeah. their own stuff. They need to look at how they can work with their their competitions and the rights yeah. holders of their competitions, mm -hmm. and try and find a way of of appeasing the fans without having to yeah. pull them in every direction and compete mm -hmm. for their time and yeah. money. No, definitely. Um, so I guess it's that that mixture of giving the fans what they want using the technology that now exists that there isn't there are the barriers to creating content are so low as we discussed earlier but make sure that we're not we're not pricing pricing fans out of the market so um right. to sum up are we good to provide le lesson six or did we, did we touch everything i, I think sure, we've yeah, had a, a, a pretty let's pretty let's interesting see. chat yeah yeah i mean there's a lot we've, we've covered there mm -hmm. um i want to say yeah if lesson six can be if you want to get into this industry, mm -hmm. you need to start creating content. And the barrier to creating content is very low, low, probably as low as it's ever been. With a with a mobile phone and an internet connection, you can do almost anything. You're out there. Mm -hmm. As you and I are doing now, we're creating a podcast, you know. Yeah. And we're basically we've set up a video call, we're recording it and, and That's it. Yeah. it to to Anchor FM if anyone's interested in creating a podcast. <laughs> and and it's it's as easy as that almost. Mm -hmm. Um and then from there, from that one piece of, of content, and this is maybe something you and I should do, Stuart, is we've got this, like, what, 30, 40-minute mm -hmm. episode. We could cut that up into 10 four-minute pieces of content. Yeah, chunks, yeah. And, and, and then you could transcribe it and write blogs. And then you mm -hmm. could, you know, look at where you can put it on different platforms. And before you know it, you're creating an awful lot of content in a very short period of time. And if you're passionate yeah. about Formula One or Premier League or... Nottingham Forest or Leicester City yeah. or Manchester United mm -hmm. or whatever it is, and you want to work in sport media in that world, you need to start creating content mm -hmm. to show what you can do to have a portfolio and to uh, get practice under your belt. And I think that's looking back, one of the big things for me is that at no point from being 15, 16 when I started making videos, mm -hmm. yeah. I ever stopped making videos. Uh, there's always the idea of like 10,000 hours of practice to be an expert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how true that is. I don't know if I've put in 10,000 hours, but I've put in a, an awful lot of hours over the last yeah. 15, 17 years making video and, and telling stories and creating content. So for me, I think that's the lesson is if, if you're interested in this world, if you want to work in this world, you need to start mm -hmm. making stuff. Great. Um, that's, that was perfectly. So um, yeah, thanks. Um, 
thanks to everyone for for listening um and do do remember to like subscribe tell your friends and as jamie said get out there and start making content of your own thanks very much guys cheers